Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Reverend Neely. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Reverend Baldwin. <laughs> It's Father Reverend David. David. Father oh, Reverend David. David. Sorry. Reverend David. Look at that. Three three candles three on candles. our week. Yeah, not quite four candles, but three. That's, that's the joke for next week, then. <laughs> Chris, what a very fetching hat you have on. You and look, I have my fetching zeitgeist jumper on. Oh, as sported in national newspapers. <laughs> and I was just asking Joe why... The sporting national newspapers are telling us that they're not; those jumpers aren't really suitable for men to, men priests to wear. And the answer was this. <laughs> the answer the was, was Joe. Well, apparently it's to do with sizing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think it's just because they're sized. Well, I don't know if they are sized for women. I mean, I'm sure a man could fit in my one. If he was small. No, I don't think he would need to be that small, to be honest. <laughs> no, 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 they are quite don't. short, though. I think no. I think the length would be problematic for a man. No, a short they fat man. Could, a short fat man could fit into it, then. <laughs> short fat man be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any that, volunteers? That's that, that really Christmas. Been. This conversation has very rapidly deteriorated. <laughs> well, I I am not going to be wearing it at the time that the short fat man. What's it? It's a shed, not a shared jumper, you understand. There we are. No. On. <laughs> well, there we are. There we are. As ever. Exciting news of the viewer that the Marks and Spencer jumper is ridiculously no doubt overpriced, over exaggerated, and doesn't fit fat menu at all. <laughs> so you won't see me in it. Purely because I'm tall, because of course my body is a temple. To uh, to health and well being. Apparently, the male one has ding dong on it. <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not even going there. I am going nowhere near that. Oh, you're thank just you very much. I'll, I'll, stick to, I'll stick to the traditional Father Christmas smiling or the the reindeer pulling a sled type of approach. I don't go for the elf. The elf bit gets some. No, I don't understand the elf at all. It's nonsense. Really. I've got a I'm carrot on my Christmas sucker. jumper. Maybe I'll wear that one next week. Oh yes, well, we can all wear our Christmas jumpers next week. Yeah, yeah, we could do. <laughs> Sounds less than enthusiastic. Should we have a pause then? Luke chapter 3 verse 7 John said to the crowds that came out to be baptised by him you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come bear fruits worthy of repentance do not begin to say to yourselves we have Abraham as our ancestor for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptised, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptise you with water. 
Sorry, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat in his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Must be over to you, Joe, because Dave's on mute. It's very unusual. <laughs> are, we are we playing that game that we talked about last week where you two aren't speaking and I've got to carry on? Oh, yeah, I'd forgotten that one. That's obviously what David's doing. <laughs> I, was I was listening to you reading that very interesting passage, Chris. I thought it was very good. I like the I like all, the, all, all of that. I mean, John the Baptist preparing the way. What are yeah, we that's doing? Not my, that's not my writing, David. That's straight out the Bible. <laughs> I thought, sorry, I thought you'd written that uh, that uh, that particular passage, Chris. Um, it, it's a very, it's a very good passage. Uh, again, last Sunday I asked people in in church what they were doing to prepare the way of the Lord mm. as we're in Advent. We had some very good discussions in Bedminster. They enjoyed that approach, which Joe introduced a few months ago, of uh, getting them involved in the sermon. They think it's a cop out that we don't do as much work, but of course we do just as much work and preparation. But it was interesting to see what their um, what their things were. But prepare the way of the Lord and baptism with water only. No Holy Spirit. No, it's coming. I, I just think that bit where he, um, they all come forward and say, well, what should we do? And he says, give them a coat if you've got a spare coat. And the tax collector said, well, what should we do? And he says, we've got to act with integrity. And the soldiers say, well, what should we do? And say, yeah, you've got to act with integrity too. And I just think if you listed all the people in the congregation, be interested, you could say, uh, and we, the retired people, what should we do? And we, the teachers, what should we do? And uh, those of us who are care workers, what should we do? And then you could widen it out to wider. Uh, and we, the politicians, what should we do? <laughs> and we, the journalists, what should we do? It'd I be really see... interesting to hear I these can... voices, I can they? see your sermon be prepared already for Sunday. It'll be interesting. <laughs> I think I'll copy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just interesting, is it? Because it's just such practical. Because John the Baptist is being really practical, isn't he? He's saying you can't. You can't rely on just being part of the covenant. So just because your children are Abraham, that's not good enough. No. You've got to repent. Mm. And that repentance is lives out in your life. And, and I love the way there's this really practical interaction about, so what then do we need to do? And I just think mm, it's a real challenge for us, isn't it? You know, actually, mm. which bit of our lives needs a bit of attention and a bit of... So you, you, in your in your list of people and professions in church, you missed out that one. And you priests, what should you do? Well, absolutely. I didn't want to miss this out at all. So I was thinking that. And actually, what should we do? Because I, I think actually at the moment, looking back over the last few years at our current society, the one thing that I notice time and time again is everybody stands up and says, this is what you should do. And it's always looking at the other. Mm. And whoever you are, it's, well, this is what you should do, or you're doing this wrong. But if we turned it round and actually said, well, what should I be doing? What can I do better? Yeah. What am I doing to prepare? Absolutely. Um, and what's interesting about, about that is that John, John the Baptist, because he was a prophetic person, was his words were seen almost as God speaking to people around who were hearing him. Hmm. What I thought were those people you mentioned, Joe, the tax collectors, the sinners, in some ways they were actually prepared to change their ways. That was the point they were asking about. You know, they certainly felt this is this is God talking to us direct. Obviously, we've got to do something. And, uh, and I think part part of the problem, or not part of the problem, part of the um, situation that you were talking about is that we were talking to people who perhaps aren't thinking about wanting to change their ways. 
and, in, and, in, and introducing the thought, how are you going to change your ways, really, for you know the arrival of God in two weeks' time or whatever? I think, yeah, absolutely. And I think you make a really good point, Chris, about us having to reflect on that for ourselves. Um, I certainly wouldn't believe that priests are beyond <laughs> that kind of self-reflection. That should be at the heart of what we're about, really. Um, and I guess the church, the church generally, the Church of England particularly, is having a sort of reflection season at the moment in the sense that it's got to work out how it is, what it is, what it does in society, how it relates to institutions that it's established in, uh, how it's going to continue for the future. Um, and within that, certainly I keep thinking, well, what is the priestly role? What, what are we called to do more of? Not what the people above me are telling me I should do more of, but what actually are we called as priests in, voca in our vocation to do more of? And I think my conclusions are to for me, to tell people that they are loved by God more, to talk about Jesus more, and to not be afraid to try and speak truth into situations that need a bit of truth spoken into. The third one's hard. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite... I mean, my, in, my email inbox this week has been quite full with... Um, people writing me to stand up for somebody who's become quite oppressed, you know, standing up for the poor, the vulnerable, where bad, you know, where unfortunate things are happening and to try and help sort it out and make their life better. And it's great that they're turning to the church for that. But like you say, if the church wasn't here in these villages and something unfair was going on, who is there that they could turn to for a bit of support that they know as an institution they need to get some support? Um, and it's fascinating yesterday chatting to this person. She said, well, you know what? I've been praying every night about this situation. You know, they do turn to prayer. And I hope her prayers are answered. But I think that is quite a... It's, to me, it's a real demonstration of what is our role. Uh, but then how do you put a value on that? It's a very good question. Because I think you're right. I think most of what the church does doesn't really equate to a market value. Liberating the oppressed, praying, walking alongside people in distress, being there being prophetic, mm. being prophetic may basically just annoys people, doesn't it, really? <laughs> so, uh, and none of that has an intrinsic market value. But we know, but yet we know how valuable it is to the people who we do that ministry alongside. And I know that there are people in the hierarchy of the Church of England asking questions of, I want to work out how we're getting value for money from our our priests. That's the uh, that's the key central thing at the moment from the Church of England. How are we getting value for money for everything? Because they're using a business model or a corporate business model for a thing for an organisation that is not a corporate organisation. Yeah. I think I think charities will give us some clues about that. We we went to visit a, a community project in Bristol a couple of weeks ago, and that's really stuck with me because a lot of the work that they were doing was very similar to the work that we would love to do or do do, which was walking alongside people, um, enabling, empowering people, helping them um, become volunteers, helping them improve their chances of getting back into work, building community, building resilience, helping mental health. Um, enabling children to flourish in education who might struggle to access education, things like that. And um, and they had to, because they're grant funded and have to regularly make account to people who literally put the money in the bank for them, they had a lot of creative ways of how you measure the unmeasurable. Um, but it, and that has really set me thinking about how we can measure that. But I guess 
if you're not careful, you can come become consumed by measuring and, uh, and not too focused on the actual work that we're doing. But it's a really interesting conversation. Mm. Well, for me, I don't know if it's interesting to anybody else. But. Yeah, I think, I think the, the church has lost its prophetic voice in many ways. You know, the old fashioned hellfire preaching. You know, and what John the Baptist, I think, is saying to us in this particular passage is, or cautioning us, is that we retain the truth of what uh, God is and is saying to us. And sometimes we overlook that because we live in a society that has changed so much from those days, and a society that wants and wants its own way and wants to do things, but only if it fits their purpose or fits their style of what they're doing. And, um, you know, I think this retaining the truth of God is important. You can reject the style in which it may be delivered, but the truth of God remains firm throughout, doesn't it? And that, as you say, um, you know, the, the poor, the oppressed, you know, the judge, making judgments which are not ours to make, lying, you know, or I've got to be careful, perhaps not lying, perhaps um, being... Um, uh, sparse with the truth, may I say, over whether Wasn't or not the phrase you've had economical with the truth. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Economical with the truth over you know whether you've had a party or not. And, and uh, as I said last night, I've worked out the new rules. Every PCC, Chris, can be held now so long as it's a socially distant party. Oh, okay. So, with, well, you can have kids and why I don't mind what you have, and and uh, and uh, and of course um, an opportunity to dramatically act out, you know, things that are going to happen. I don't know. So, yeah, but the truth of God remains, and I think we've got to we've got to stick to that, and got to be proud to stick to the fact that it's God's truth that we're here to bring. With it, and as you say, Joe, as that charity does, they may not see it as being God they're delivering. Um, but they're delivering what is right and truthful and honest and needed in a society that is faltering so often. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, often we think in this country we're such a wealthy country that God isn't needed. It's probably one of the biggest arguments you hear against the church or against believing in God, that we're all self-sufficient. And yet if we look at the way our country's is at the moment it's probably further away from the love of god than it's ever been absolutely um you know See, I, I wrote in this month's magazine or do you know yeah this month with the old november's magazine uh didn't i that um you know we were once a christian country and because we've let go of that and the church hasn't stood up for its its place in society we've stopped being that but we've we've become a civilized or a secular society Money is never going to bring you healing or salvation. No. It might bring pleasure, but it's not going to bring the things that we believe come from God. And that sense of justice, purpose, value, compassion, love, forgiveness, all those things. And that's exactly where we came in with your jumper, believe. <laughs> and that's exactly where we can come out at the end of our rev chat. Believe. Really believe. interesting stuff, people. Excellent. Well done. Well done. You can find us uh, in our regular haunts on social media, our Facebook pages, Egerton and Commerce Benefits, members to teamchurches.org. Uh, see us, find us, com communicate with us, and we'd love to hear from you. And we'll see you again very soon. Or, or just lurking under a lamppost in the town centre. <laughs> Through wearing our Christmas jumpers. That's right. If you yeah. see us, say hello. And uh, yeah, and we'll see you again very, very soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.